course, your TCS Honcho. Time for another installment of Metal on Metal, TCS Talk, continuing with the series of introduction to TCS. This is session number 10. We're going to look at smoke, both from artillery and mortars and infantry guns, illumination, and mines. So there's different places in the rules where you'll find these. I've uh, referred to them here so you can follow along in your rule book. I advise you to do that. Whatever's in the rule book trumps whatever I say. <laughs> so I've been known to make mistakes here, uh, other than the fact that, well, people make mistakes. I've been playing TCS since version 2 and have been involved in editing things. And sometimes I've not quite caught up in my own mind at the current edition of the rules, even if I'm responsible for them. So with all that having been said, keep your rule book with you to check these things. We're going to check, like, like I said, we'll look at the smoke, both artillery and uh, smoke for mortars, illumination rounds, same deal. And when I say mortars, I mean mortars and infantry guns, both. And then we'll look at mines. Mines, uh, in my experience, is something, mine fields uh, are things that beginners tend to ignore. And that's because they're sort of near the end of the rule book. There's enough to worry about, think about when you're learning the TCS. But as long as the game allows mines, each specific game will state in the rules whether minefields can be placed or not. If there's nothing prohibiting them, keep those in mind because whenever you implement a prepared defense op sheet with infantry platoons, you can lay mines and they can actually help quite a bit. So we'll talk about that in just a bit. What happens when units cross mines and how do you breach mines so that you can cross them safely without being attacked. First of all, let's do some basics on smoke. There are smoke markers in the game. There are markers like this one here. They have a one and a two, that's for artillery smoke. There are also mortar, smark, uh, mortar smoke markers. Each of these markers has an infinitely high level of smoke that's gonna block line of sight. Also, smoke fills the hex sides. That's important if you're tracing line of sight along a hex mine. In order to uh, use artillery smoke, treat it exactly like you treat a, normally, a normal artillery mission, but declare that you're using smoke ammo instead of HE or whatever else you might be doing. Roll for it normally, you need to uh, roll for adjustment, and you need to achieve at least a bad shoot for artillery. This can also be a result of scatter. Remember that when artillery missions scatter, you roll to see where they land and then there are bad shoots, so the, the smoke will appear there. If you are firing mortar smoke, you have to roll on the mortar and infantry gun smoke table, which means that you've got a 50-50 chance that it's gonna go off. And the mortar is still marked as fired, even if no smoke uh, marker is placed. That represents them trying to lay out smoke, but the smoke just dissipated or wasn't put in the correct place. You can see into, fire into, and out of smoke hexes, but not through them. Smoke cannot be placed in all water hexes. If it scatters there from an artillery mission, the ammo is expended, but it's treated as a no-shoot. Smoke does not affect movement. In some games, uh, there's a, an increased movement cost to enter smoke hexes not in the TCS system. One important aspect with this, when you have an artillery smoke marker with either two or one here, that affects not only the hex it's in, but also all six surrounding hexes, including their hex spines that fills out the, um, the hex sides of those hexes as well. Smoke disappears with time. Artillery smoke lasts two turns. That's why it has a two and a one on it. When you initially fire and successfully place an artillery smoke mission, place it on the two side. At the end of the turn, during cleanup, all artillery smoke is reduced or removed. Any level 1s are pulled off, any level 2s are flipped over to level 1. Infantry and mortar gun, no, no, let's say that again, mortar and infantry gun smoke is not removed in the cleanup phase, but it's removed at the beginning of the player phase who fired it. And this means that the smoke will last until your next action phase. And that might not be long. For instance, if you're in the second action phase in one turn and then you're in the first and next, the smoke's going to go right away. On the sort of opposite uh, side of things, if you're the first player in one action phase and fire smoke, and then you're second the next turn, the smoke's going to last quite a while. All that to say that mortar and infantry gun smoke is tied to your action phase, not the cleanup phase at the end of the turn. Illumination is similar. Illumination, uh, well, similar and not similar, obviously. Illumination has a radius of 3 for mortar alum or 5 for artillery. That's what it depends on. When you're firing alum as an artillery mission, you do not need a spotter, and you actually don't have to roll on the adjustment table at all. All you do is take the artillery alum marker, place it where you want it, and there it is. No fuss, no mess. 
Likewise, if you're doing mortar uh, art uh, alum, you can place it anywhere within range of the mortar and you don't have to roll on table or anything. It's just there. Any unit, and, and these have a radius, all the hexes within that radius are illuminated. And for spotting observation, they are treated as daylight. So uh, it's a little, it's one way in the sense that if you have targets illuminated and you're not illuminated, you can see them, but they cannot see you. Uh, when you are firing at or dealing with a hex that's illuminated, you don't have the night effects on the fire table, but the morale table still stays the same. They're still considered you have the negative morale ben um, negative morale effect for nighttime. Alum only works during the night. If it's a dusk or dawn, it doesn't help. So the, 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 your line of sight will be pretty limited during dusk and dawn. It's removed like smoke, so artillery alum is, is removed during cleanup, in mortar, and if your gun alum is removed at the beginning of your next action phase. If a unit is in an alum hex, it can see other illuminated hexes, but it can only see non-illuminated hexes that are next to it, a range of one. They're sort of blinded a little bit. Now at night, often the visibility is one hex anyway, so that doesn't really matter, but sometimes it's two. So it, you could see the case where uh, a unit that's two away in, in a, in a non-illuminated hex at night can't be seen by a unit in an illuminated hex. So that's, that's something that can happen when you're playing. Let's look at minefields. Minefields, first of all, are neutral. That is, they're not friendly in enemy minefields. They'll attack anybody, equal opportunity aggressors. It costs two extra movement points to enter a minefield hex. If you move into a minefield hex, you move into it, you undergo any overwatch fires and any attacks by artillery, by continuous fire missions that are out there still. And then, um, and you can actually insult into a minefield hex too, if it's occupied by an enemy, that's fine, but the minefield will attack you first. It attacks, if you're moving in with foot movement, it attacks you with strength of 18. If you're moving in with vehicle type movement, each step you roll two, two um, six-sided dice, add them up on an eight or a higher, that step is eliminated. In other words, that's close to 50% casualties. I can't ever remember playing a game where somebody ran into a minefield with vehicles. I guess it's possible, not advised, pretty dangerous. Often uh, the minefields will begin the game in a scenario, but you can place them. How does that work? If you implement a new prepared defense op sheet, for every two inf infantry platoons on that op sheet, you may place within four hexes of the two infantry platoons who are generating the minefield, a minefield. It can go anywhere except a water hex, obviously. So you can place this minefield anywhere within four hexes, as I mentioned, of these two platoons. However, it must be at least five hexes away from the nearest enemy unit. That is one restriction. There's otherwise, uh, other than not dropping it in a pond, there's no restriction on terrain. Yes, it can go into town or village. That's not expressly forbidden. And some interesting possibilities arise from that. Remember again that sometimes you can't lay new minefields in a scenario, or there might be a certain number of minefields you can lay, depending on the supplies available to the troops in that particular scenario or game. How do you breach a minefield? Minefields attack everybody on the 18 column. As I said before, you can uh, cut lanes through them, breach them, uh, clear them, as it were. How does this work? Dismounted infantry platoons that are not suppressed or paralyzed, that are adjacent to the minefield or in the minefield, in either mode, this should be interesting to you by now, can attempt to breach a minefield. What's the process? As your whole move for that turn, you can't SFA or anything with these guys, this is all they're doing. You declare that you're trying to breach the minefield, move the counter onto the minefield hex. This is a movement-based Overwatch trigger. Now, if you followed my tutorials, you should be scratching your head right now because it can be in either mode. Does this mean that infantry platoons in fire mode are actually moving? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Remember when I said earlier that you have to be in move mode to move and fire mode, you only fire, you can't move? Well, I lied. There's actually this one little exception here. You can move into this. Think of this as the guys crawling on their bellies trying to, to clear the minefield. And so this is the, the one situation, at least that I can think of, it, where a unit in... Um, in fire mode actually moves of its own volition. Fine, it declares that it's trying to breach the minefield and as you would expect if there are any artillery missions ongoing, continuous fire missions, those attack this unit. It's a movement-based overwatch trigger. 
any overwatch is resolved return overwatch possibly as well if the unit is still there that is it's not retreated away attack it on the nine column if after all that's just a straightforward die roll no no modifiers if after all this junk the unit is still there the one that's trying to clear or breach the minefield and it's neither suppressed nor paralyzed and it's in normal good morale then flip the counter over to this side the minefield is breached what does that do this minefield no longer attacks people moving into it the movement cost addition is still there it's still plus two extra movement points to move into this thing but it will not attack units however two things do remain one you cannot SYR through this minefield safely. If you SYR into the minefield hex, it's treated as a live minefield. You're attacked on the 18 column for foot movement targets, and each vehicle has to make its nasty survival roll. In addition, it's a bottleneck. So if you move into this breach minefield hex, playing two, two extra movement points, you're not going to be attacked by it, but the, your opponent has two movement-based overwatch triggers at you now because you're in sort of thin columns just those those lanes that have been cleared you're a much better target much easier to see okay let's try to look at some examples of what i've talked about so far we've talked about smoke we've talked about illum and we've talked about minefields at this point here i've got some markers out this is a little situation from gd42 that in my experience tends to develop often in the mid game some German units in Galichkina trying to defend themselves against Soviets moving here from the south. So there are a lot of different things that can happen here. If this Soviet formation, say they've got two, it looks like they've got two infantry companies, roughly, and some supporting units, is trying to attack this way, it may decide, the Soviets may decide, all right, we want to reduce the front that we're using to attack here, and we can do that doing smoke. So this would be a fine time, say these units are somewhere spotting, let's call in a smoke mission right about here. If you're going to have to roll on the table to make sure it's a good or a bad shoot, at least. And with the Soviets in this game, that's not a joke. There's already maybe a one-third chance it's going to happen. If this artillery marker is placed during the artillery and the aircraft phase, these all these six hexes will be surrounded. And what that's going to do for the Soviets is now only this unit can really see them. This unit is going to be blocked by this hill. And let's just take a look under there to see... Uh, what's going on yeah per, yeah and this one's going to be blocked here by the smoke so that's isolating the the enemy a bit all of these units can then concentrate on this one without fear of being shot at or having uh, artillery missions spotted here now since there's only one unit here if the soviets are fortunate and they suppress this target they're going to be immune to artillery fire because only the suppressed unit would be able to spot and they're suppressed and they can't spot you so that's a good thing so that's one good use of smoke if you've got a mortar sitting out, and in fact we do, let's just put him there, he could then, if this f failed, suppose he weren't able to get that off, you can try to do mortar smoke, I would say right about there. That would have virtually the same effect of blocking these two guys. This is a hex spy, would also be blocked, so Soviet unit here, for instance, I, don't, I wouldn't put it there, I'd put it right about there. Uh, this unit cannot spot that hex, nor here either, because the spine is blocked. He's safe from artillery spotting from this guy, and if they suppress him, then they're going to be in pretty good shape. They can then spread out, concentrate all their fire, and hope to reduce his position. If they can keep that going for three turns, they might have a chance of uh, getting this guy out. Now, if you've played TCS at all, you know that troops with pretty decent morale dug in in serious terrain... Uh, like here you see it's partially protective and that's protective even very difficult to get rid of them all right so that's one possible use of smoke and it's really to limit your opponent's ability to fire at you and especially to target you with artillery that is very much the, the this game too if it were a night situation suppose the soviets were trying to do a night assault and they've kind of uh, maybe have some out here something like that then we could try to drop some alum rounds and if we use artillery for alum i don't remember the soviets actually have it in this game but we'll just say that they do where are we going to want to drop it we're probably going to want to drop it five hexes away like this one two three four five or you're, you're what you want to do is put it so that all of these guys are eliminated but you are not uh, so that's possible you might even think about putting it there and that eliminates just these guys, but not him. Well, that's a little strange. Maybe like that. The problem there is that this hex is now eliminated too if the Soviets move there. So do some thinking. 
in, in terms of how you want to do it. Possibly you could use two, one, two, three, four, five. That gets these guys. And then you could drop a mortar one right here to get him. And you'll have all these hexes illuminated and these will not be illuminated. That might be the, the better tactic to do that. If they're eliminated, and suppose the Soviets are set up like this, and maybe put this tank uh, like here, etc., even something like that, these units would all be able to shoot at this one because the hex is eliminated, but these units cannot fire back because if you are in an illuminated hex, you can only shoot at an adjacent non-illuminated hex. In this situation, the Germans would probably want to drop an alum round over here to, to even things out a little bit. But if you're um, at night and you have a loom and your opponent does not, this gives you all sorts of options of stacking the game in your favor and that you can light up on your opponent and he cannot fire back at you. I encourage you to think about the rules and how you can apply them in such situations like that. Let's look at one more situation and I'm going to pull out some minefield counters first off and we'll play with these. So let's say the Soviets have not yet attacked. They're moving from off map here somewhere. And the Germans have just implemented a prepared defense option. They are allowed to play, place a minefield for every two platoons. There are four platoons here, so they can place two minefields. This is rounded down, so if the Pioneers were not here, the, Ger the Germans would only be able to place one minefield, because you round down, they've only got three. We'll give them the Pioneer though, and let's place two. Where to place them? This is a great question. It's actually not at all that straightforward. You can use minefields to prevent the opponent, or at least slow them down from flanking you. So within four, two, three, four, we could put these, say, here. I don't think that has much of a point, though, because uh, if, if you can't really observe the minefields, the opponent will just breach them in a turn and then move along their merry way. Minefields are much more effective if you can observe them. So I would think strongly about something like that. And I had shown you earlier that you could isolate this unit, but now he's got some extra protection. Uh, the Soviets are really going to want to move adjacent to try to get guys out or even move an assault, and this is going to gum up the works entirely. So if um, the Soviets move into these hexes in move mode, they're just going to get attacked by the minefield and then they're going to get pinned down. It's going to be very, very ugly. And... Um, if they move into it to, to try to clear it out, they will get all these overwatch triggers at range one as well. So that's, it very much discourages during combat uh, uh, the Soviets from doing this. This then channels them in this front. And if they're coming in this way, then they're gonna have to take fire from all these guys. It's much more difficult to get around there. So that might be a nice, nice way to do it. If this were happening, the Soviets could try to breach these. Now let's just go through that process. I really wouldn't recommend it, but let's just say they're gonna try it. And why not? We'll put a tank in there just to give him a little cover when he's doing that. During the Soviet movement phase, they can declare a breach here. If there's no artillery going on, which I don't see any, this is a movement-based overwatch trigger. They move in here. Let's just say we're trying to breach this hex right there. It's range one. The German has a seven. It's going to have a plus two. If this is the unit that fires, we'll just say it is. It has a plus two for being adjacent. There's no plus two for move mode because it's in fire mode, so that's nice. It's open terrain. Um, that and so that's going to be a, a seven plus two and we can see what happens roll let's just say nothing happens the next thing that we do is this unit is attacked by the minefield and when you're breaching it's a nine and if we pull out the table let's see if i can get the charts right here for the fire resolution the nine column is right about there if it's suppressed then um, it is stuck there suppressed and the minefield is not breached and it can try to do it next turn once it, you assume it recovers from suppression. Of course, we know as well from earlier tutorials that if you are suppressed and try to unsuppress, that offers your opponent an overwatch trigger right here. So these guys might be pinned down for a long time. Probably not the best thing to try to go through a minefield right there and that's exactly why they're useful. Now one more idea of placing minefields is to actually place them in the hexes with your units. What? You gasp? Is this possible? Yes it is. What does it do? It does not prevent the Soviets from marching adjacent. They can do this and they can light, light up on them and fire all they want. But it certainly does hinder them from assaulting because if they assault into this hex they're going to be attacked by the minefield. The minefield is not going to affect a unit in it. It only attacks you when you move into it. It does not attack when you leave or just sit there. So this German platoon is safe in the minefield. However, if they retreat, it's going to be pretty tricky getting back in. So that's the downside of that. 
it's great for holding it against assaults and that it forces you, your opponent to move right into the minefield before they assault. Obviously, you cannot breach a minefield that's occupied by the enemy either. Why? Because to breach it, you have to move into the hex, but you are not allowed to move into the hex with an enemy unit. And no, you cannot combine a breaching attempt with an assault, just for you guys who are thinking of trying to do that. So I think um, the, the tactics of actually using minefield, there's, there's lots of different ideas. There's lots of ways to do it. It's actually kind of an interesting tactical problem. Should I do that? Should I perhaps put one in here uh, like that and one minefield there to protect these guys? Who knows? I think the, it's an open book in terms of how you use these most effectively. All right, let's finish up then and just kind of review what we've talked about. We talked about all sorts of stuff. We talked about smoke, illum, laying mines, crossing minefields, bridging minefields. I would encourage you guys to look at the rules carefully here. I may have omitted some stuff, who knows? You can check on mine. These are the small details that if you master these, this will really help you become a better TCS player. Uh, the next section, number 11 coming up, we will talk about assault combat.